in this circle there's gotta be room for them move on over make a little room for them there'll be trouble. whether black or white all North Carolinians in the spring of 1954 realized the profound implications of Brown versus Board of Education. The Supreme Court's unanimous May 17 decision mandated the end of racially segregated public education. On a broader level, Brown implied the ultimate demise of the American system of racial apartheid. Thrilled by Brown's message, Black teachers read out the decision in the state's Jim Crow schools. As one high school senior in rural Montgomery County would later recall, I heard Brown as millennial. I heard the court in Brown saying blacks were now free. This was the signal that I could do anything. Certain white North Carolinians also accepted Brown. From a pulpit in Gastonia, a white minister urged his parishioners to view Brown through a prism of Christian compassion. And so now for several years I have held the conviction, and I still hold it, that the practice of segregation cannot be defended on the basis of the Christian religion. And now that the highest judicial body in this republic of ours consisting of nine men appointed by three different presidents of the United States has given this unanimous decision. I feel it to be my conscientious duty to do my best to implement this action helpfully, patiently, lovingly, and realistically. Although a few whites preached acceptance of Brown, North Carolina's political leadership responded differently. State legislative leaders wasted little time putting up obstacles to desegregation. In March 1955, the North Carolina General Assembly passed the nation's first anti-Brown law. The Pupil Placement Act armed local school boards with convenient reasons to refuse the admission of black pupils to white schools. One year later, the state's white establishment, under the leadership of Governor Luther Hodges, employed the so-called Pearsall Plan as a second line of resistance against Brown. It emerged from a special legislative committee established by the governor and headed by State Senator Thomas Pearsall. Approved four to one in a statewide referendum, the Pearsall Plan amended the North Carolina Constitution. The plan allowed tuition grants to whites fleeing desegregated schools and permitted communities to close local schools desegregated by court order. Beginning in the late 1950s, political leaders and school officials in several Piedmont cities surrendered to token desegregation. By appearing amenable to a limited desegregation process, white leaders bought time, hoping ultimately to fight off widespread school integration. The first black students to enter white schools were greeted with contempt and hostility. Within schools, these black students were ostracized. But black parents pushed ahead. In the late 1950s and early 1960s, they filed lawsuits that challenged student assignment schemes known first as pupil placement and later as freedom of choice. These black parents were represented by the state NAACP Legal Redress Committee, a group of a few dozen black lawyers who collaborated closely with the National NAACP Legal Defense Fund. Black parents attempting to enroll their children in white schools feared reprisal. 
I sat in living rooms in black homes in, in, in Lumberton and people crying, you know, my husband and wife crying, debating whether or not they should send their kid to the white high school back in the choice days because the, the guy worked in a, gas station, in a gas station, he knew he was going to get fired, and the woman worked as a domestic and she knew she was going to get, lose her job, and yet they wanted their kids to have a decent, a better education than the royally underfunded black schools. I mean, people sitting there crying, trying to figure this stuff out. Despite racial terrorism by North Carolina's well-organized Ku Klux Klan, black parents persisted. In Camden County, young Joyce Farabee was one of the first black students to attend the local white schools. Her father refused to be intimidated by a Klan cross burning in their front yard. What happened was after they burned the cross in our yard, you know, Daddy saw uh, up the road, this was going to help me to be where I am so that I can help somebody else, other nieces and nephews and other children. And so I went back, but they thought they were going to stop us, but it didn't. In Robeson County, many Lumbee parents preferred to retain separate Indian schools and resisted initial desegregation efforts. Henry Oxendine, who favored full integration without delay, recalls the local preference for freedom of choice as a way to avoid desegregation. One of the solutions was, well, instead of forcing parents to send their kids to the nearest school to them, we're going to have freedom of choice and we're going to give parents the opportunity to send their kids to whatever school they want to. What they should have done in, when they started uh, desegregating and trying to integrate the schools is said, well, if you, if you live within the Piney Grove Elementary School District, then regardless of your race, you go to Piney Grove. But that would have been unacceptable and it would have created a lot of problems because during that period of time, whites did not want to go to Indian schools. Black, uh, Indians didn't want to go to black schools. And so they came up with this thing called freedom of choice. Despite the continuing struggles of black parents, school desegregation proceeded at a glacial pace in North Carolina through the 1960s. By the fall of 1964, fewer than 2% of black children attended integrated schools. Confronted by such dismal statistics, federal judges in North Carolina and elsewhere signaled a growing impatience with the delaying tactics of white school officials. After 1965, the U.S. Justice Department and the Department of Health, Education, and Welfare brought new pressure to bear on state and local school officials. However, as late as 1968, only one in five black children attended integrated schools across North Carolina. The state continued to operate separate schools for whites, blacks, and Native Americans. Fourteen years after the landmark Supreme Court ruling, Brown's promise was left unfulfilled. Yeah.